It's fascinating to compare how things are today with how they used to be, particularly on Britain's railway network, where the changes in the second half of the 20th century have been immense, both for the better and for the worse. This is the first in a series of five programmes looking at the legacies of the great railway companies and British railways and how they changed during public ownership by comparing them then and now. We begin this series in 1959 at Brunel's magnificent Paddington Station, opened in 1854 for the Great Western Railway as what was arguably the most famous of all Great Western engines, number 6000, King George V, arrives. In diffidence to his regal majesty, humble pannier tanks go about their equally important duties, this one leaving the terminus before King George V blasts his way westward. The engine was built at Swindon in June 1927 and appeared at the Baltimore and Ohio Centenary Exhibition in the USA that same year. Another 460 backs down and is followed by a clean, green, large prairie, nicknamed by enthusiasts Tanner Wands. Number 6157 arrives with yet more empty carriage stock to await its train engine, number 5011 Tintagel Castle, built at Swindon, in 1927. The castle class was developed from Churchwood's famous stars and designed by C.B. Collett, chief mechanical engineer of the Great Western Railway from 1922 to 1941. More members of this most important class are seen. 166 were built at Swindon from 1923 to 1950 to form the backbone of the Great Western Express passenger fleet. Tintagel Castle's driver gives her the once-over as an interloper in the form of an LMER Thompson B1 complete with Bresley coaches trundles in. Apart from the British Railway's logo on her tender, we could be back in Great Western days as Tintagel Castle heads westwards with her train of chocolate and cream carriages. She was scrapped at Cashmore's Great Bridge in December 1962. 6157 follows the train out, no doubt heading for Old Oak Common carriage sidings to pick up more coaching stock. One of Collett's 259 halls runs into Paddington next. These were developed from Churchwood Saint class of 1902. They were the largest class of mixed traffic engines on the GWR. In the background, an immaculate double-chimneyed castle arrives with a train from the West Country. The double chimneys were being fitted to many castles at this time. In all his regal majesty, King Class Number 6018, King Henry VI, waits to depart with an express. These engines, owing to their high axle loading of 22 and a half tons, were only allowed on certain routes, such as the Bristol and Exeter main lines from Paddington. The Carmine and Cream liveried coaches were always called blood and custard by enthusiasts. On New Year's Day 1964, pannier and prairie tanks are seen fussing about on empty coaching stock duties to and from Old Oak Common carriage sidings. Collett's 4615 takes out parcel vans as Hawksworth Pannier 8433 brings stock in. F.W. Hawksworth was the last chief mechanical engineer of the Great Western Railway, being in office from 1941 to 49. And this design was one of the last of the long line of Great Western Pannier tank classes. Four six one five returns. A member of the numerically largest class of panniers, she was built as part of Lot 330 at Swindon in 1941 and scrapped there in December 1964. Small Prairie 5564 appears out of the gathering gloom. These small wheeled 262 tanks were ideal for branch line work and were to be seen over many secondary lines of the GWR, most notably in the West Country. George Jackson Churchwood, chief mechanical engineer of the Great Western from 1902 to 1921, 
designed this class in 1906. Brunel's overall glass roof can be seen as 4615 departs, carrying target disc 2. All the station pilots were allocated a number for their specific duties, and up to 12 pilots were in different places. Churchill's small prairies were long-lived. 175 engines were built up to 1929, and 5564 was one of the last batch built in that year. 5564 lasted for 37 years before she was scrapped by Cox and Danks at Park Royal. After crossing over outside the station, 5564 re-enters at Platform 9 and passes the site of the original Paddington Terminus of 1838. Hawksworth's 210 panniers were not destined to live the long life of Churchwood's prairies. 9415 was built in 1950 by Robert Stevenson and Hawthorne's of Newcastle and was scrapped only 15 years later at Wards of Britain Ferry. Their demise was brought about by falling traffic and the introduction of the ubiquitous 350 horsepower 060 diesel shunters, part of British Railway's rapid dieselization policy of the 1950s and 60s. 5564 scurries by once again with empty coaching stock. By 1964, even the mighty castles were not exempt from these duties, and here, double-chimneyed castle 7020, Gloucester Castle, is on duty three, as depicted by her target disc. She is in a filthy condition, most unusual for these magnificent machines, although sadly all too prevalent at this time. Gloucester Castle was built in 1948, and is fitted with a Hawksworth straight-sided tender. She met her end at Hayes of Bridgend just a year later, in January 1965. Paddington Station owes its spaciousness to having been built for Isambard Kingdom Brunel's incomparable broad gauge of seven feet and a quarter inch. Hawksworth Pannier 9418 with target disc two runs out of the station before Gloucester Castle pulls away on her unusual duties. Whilst it made sense for express locomotives to bring in their own stock at times, they weren't really suited to general station duties like this, for which the panniers were specifically designed. Collett's 6100 class large prairies were originally built for the Oxford and Reading to Paddington suburban services. The class had 70 examples and was a development of Churchwood's 3100 class, having higher boiler pressure than other members of the large prairie classes. 6124 was built at Swindon in October 1931 and scrapped at Bird's Risker in October 1964. A brief glimpse of the new order is seen in the shape of a Western class diesel hydraulic Western Hero. On a brighter day in May 1964, more standard collet panniers, such as 3618 and 9659, are seen. This class of engine was built in eight main batches, with minor detail differences, between 1929 and 1948. The class eventually totaled 863. They were the shunting workhorses of the GWR. There was hardly a freight yard or passenger station where they were not present. Tanner 1 6135 arrives and departs in the gloom. One of the last survivors, she was scrapped by Cashmores of Newport in March 1966. This was a sad time for all lovers of the steam locomotive, as what seemed to have been inviolate was thrown onto the scrap heap with what appeared to be indecent haste. The appalling condition of these station pilots, and even the express passenger locomotives, is a sorry comparison with what we saw just five years previously. Great Western Steam would have just under 20 months left. The Western Region eliminated steam by the 3rd of January, 1966.
However, it's now the 9th of May, 1964, and there's not an anorak in sight, only a duffel bag, probably laden with a bottle of Tizer and cheese and daddy sauce sandwiches. Prairie 6163 is surveyed as she backs out, but the enthusiasts have gathered to see Pendennis Castle arrive to work on Ian Allen's special rail tour to Plymouth. This special was to commemorate the historic run of City of Truro 60 years earlier, when she was recorded by Charles Roos Martin at 102.3 miles per hour down Whitehall. A lot of film is exposed on the beautifully clean 4079, not only by the enthusiasts on the platform, as the crew of Pannier 8498 also recorded the event. Unfortunately for her passengers, Pendennis Castle was to fail at Lavington after achieving a maximum speed of 96 miles per hour. She's preserved on the other side of the world, in Australia. on nearly a third of a century for our first views of the modern railway now. We remain at Paddington Station as a successor to the kings and castles of the 1960s, an HST or high-speed train, also known as an Intercity 125, approaches the famous number one platform at Paddington. In the early 1990s, the station had undergone a vast modernization of its track layout the original signalling and track being fully modernised for the needs of the next century. By this time, locomotives had been completely abandoned. All trains into the terminus were formed of multiple unit stock, able to run equally well in either direction. Thus, an incoming train can now become an outgoing one by the simple expedient of the driver changing ends. This applies equally to suburban stock, these latter are being formed of networker units. A major change is not easily seen. As a result of the Conservative government's privatisation of the railways in the mid-1990s, the trains seen here are operated by rival franchisees. At least three operators now run trains to or through Paddington, the third being London Underground Limited, whose Hammersmith and City branch of the Metropolitan Line still operates as it did in the 1960s, from the northernmost platforms of the terminus, giving direct access to the City of London. One thing that hasn't changed is the signal box on the end of Platform 10 although its function has. The old goods shed that was prominent in our earlier shots has now vanished, and the Westway M40 motorway now dominates the skyline to the north of Paddington. The skyline above the tracks is also undergoing alteration as overhead wires and gantries are erected in preparation for the arrival of another operator, the British Airports Authority's Heathrow Express Service, the first electric trains to work over ex-Great Western Metals out of London. The Heathrow Express Service will bring the number of operators at Paddington on XBR Metals to three. Traditional Great Western routes are served by Great Western trains and Thames trains. The latter serves local stations out to Reading and on to Newbury, Didcot, Oxford and beyond to places such as Hereford. Great Western, as befits a company which has taken the famous title, operates long-distance trains to the classic Great Western towns and cities such as Bristol, Cardiff, Swansea, Exeter, Plymouth and Penzance. All services utilising the celebrated HSTs, now 20 years old.
Thames Trains uses the ultra-modern network of multiple units, which normally operate alone or in pairs, as here. Two and three car units are in use. The latter includes some Class 166 air-conditioned units, a far cry from the slam door stock we saw in use in 1964. Real Great Western trains have made a welcome return to Paddington in recent years. Both a king and a castle worked out of the terminus once again in the 1990s. This is King Edward I in January 1994. In November 1991, it was Nunny Castle that evoked the memories. Sadly, the re-signalling and overhead wires have restricted access for steam to Brunel's great cathedral to the age of steam. But we can relive it as often as we like on video. Return to the real age of steam on the 25th of July 1965, as spotlessly cleaned IVAT Mogo number 46509 comes off the Thames Valley Rail Tour at Kensington Olympia. An equally spotless 6106 runs past a North British Type 2 diesel and takes over the train. This station, formerly known as Addison Road, is on the West London Extension. In its heyday, it was a mecca for London enthusiasts, as it was an important engine-changing point for the many summer holiday expresses from the Midlands and Northwest, bound for the southeast coast. The tour ran around the western suburban lines. A specially cleaned pannier tank number 9773 runs past. Number 6106 waits in the platform as 9773 couples on to the other end. Southall engine shed can be seen in the background. Ninety-seven seventy-three was to take the train down the Brentford branch. This branch was opened as a broad gauge line in 1859 and provided the GWR with its main access to the Port of London. Here, 9773 ran around her train to return to Kensington Olympia. With the end of steam imminent, and even though it was in excellent condition, 9773 was scrapped at Cashmores of Newport just 11 months later. The branch lasted rather longer, although it had already lost its passenger service, as it remained in use into the 1980s to serve the oil terminal which had been established there. Like Paddington, Kensington Olympia also thrives today. In fact, it sees more trains than ever before in its history, as the West London line has been fully upgraded to support its role as the principal through London route. This is the successor to those trains to the southeast coast, an intercity cross-country train service for Gatwick Airport and Brighton.
After many years, a through local service linking North and South London via Kensington was re-established in the 1990s, at first using these now obsolete heritage diesel multiple units. They were due for replacement by electric units in 1996. Perhaps the most important trains to pass through Kensington are the intercontinental Eurostars. These advanced trains run from their depot at North Pole on the Great Western Main Line to Waterloo, the initial channel tunnel terminus. During 1996, through services to the north of England and Scotland were due to be introduced, also running via this route. The line has always been important for freight, a purpose which was enhanced during the nationalised British Railways era. Some of the earliest privately operated trains on the system, the Foster Yeoman and ARC Stone trains, have become regular users of the line, the recent upgrading having increased its capacity and the speeds permissible. The opening of the Channel Tunnel has also seen a large increase in the freight traffic through Olympia. This was entrusted to a division of British Railways, Rail Freight Distribution, or RFD, which remained in the public sector at the time this programme was completed in early 1996. Traffic for the continent via Kensington Olympia was showing large gains, and the station would remain one of the few places in London where one could observe such a wide variety of locomotive types in the 1990s. This is a Class 37, the mainstay of general freight haulage throughout the country. The principal freight businesses, excluding RFD and Freightliner, were split into three operating companies in 1994 in preparation for privatization. After going to a great deal of trouble to establish separate identities and vestigial competition, all three were sold in 1996 to an American operator, Wisconsin Central. They had the unenviable task of reuniting them to form a cohesive entity to fight back against the real enemy of rail freight, the road transport industry. The last investment in railway freight infrastructure before privatization was the 100-strong Class 60 diesel type. One of these heads a private operator's stone train through Olympia to give our final view of the freight operations of railways now. This is an area which will surely change radically once again. What will it look like ten years hence? We tend to forget that many parts of the railway network closed before the infamous Dr. Beeching arrived on the scene. One of these branches was the short line to Wallingford, which ceased passenger operations on the 13th of June 1959. Chelsea and Molesford, on the Great Western Main Line near Didcart, was the junction station for the branch. It was opened by the Wallingford and Watlington Company on the 2nd of July, 1866, the original owning company being absorbed by the GWR in 1872. There were no other stations on the line, only the terminus station at Wallingford. There was a carnival atmosphere at the station, and fog detonators were placed on the rail. A Collet 1400-042 tank plus auto coach trundled up and down the line as passengers waited at Wallingford station to travel on the last train. 
Wallingford must have had more passengers on the last day than the whole of the last year. The staff seemed to be happy, as in those days closure meant just a transfer to somewhere else, not the dole like today. We join passengers boarding the train as the branch line manager sports his GWR station master's hat. The cheerful footplate crew welcomes visitors as the points are changed. Extra carriages are coupled onto the train to accommodate the crowds. Even the shunter sports a buttonhole. The mayor arrives complete with gown, chain of office and tricorn hat. He's followed by the town council. The train, hauled by Collet 1400 tank number 1444, is seen from the footplate and photographed by the many spectators on the line side. Collett designed these 042 tanks to replace engines of the 517 class, which dated from the 1890s. These little engines were perhaps the classic image of the Great Western Branch Line train, their routes going back to the Victorian age, emphasized by their enormous steam domes. They were, in a word, elegant. The first engine, then numbered 4800, appeared in 1932. 95 engines were built, 75 being fitted for auto working on branch lines. 1444 was scrapped at Hayes Bridge End in April 1965. The name board at Chelsea and Molesford was so big it needed a middle support. A castle runs through with an express as the crowds await the last passenger train, or so they thought. These scenes show how much everything has changed, from the happy atmosphere even when a line closed, to the actual railway equipment in use which had changed very little since the turn of the century. Perhaps herein lies the very failure of railways, the cost of modernization of such a huge infrastructure, even on a minor branch like this, could never be justified. On a gloomy day, five and a half years later, on the 12th of December 1965, West Country Pacific number 34015 Exmouth runs light engine through Chelsea and Molesford. The Wallingford branch had remained open for freight traffic to the associated British malt silos after the passenger traffic had finished. So it had become a focus for rail tour operators. Smith had hauled the Locomotive Club of Great Britain's rail tour, the Cross Countryman, from Basingstoke. She handed over the train to an old friend, Pannier Tank number 9773. The latter was in an absolutely deplorable condition, a far cry from her former glories. 
9773 would stall on the return from Wallingford, and Exmouth had to be sent down the branch to rescue her. This must have been the only time that a bullet Pacific traversed the branch. This still wasn't the end for the Wallingford branch. Our story moves from a Great Western engine in a deplorable condition to one in an immaculate condition. As shiny as a new pin, call it number 1466, one of the four preserved 1400 class tanks, is seen as she plies up and down the Wallingford branch on the 15th of May 1968. She was, and still is, based at the Great Western Society's nearby headquarters at Ditcott. This was a unique event, as the line still belonged to British Railways, who were to dispense with all steam locomotive services barely three months later. The nationalised concern would then impose a national steam ban that would prevent such recurrences for nearly a quarter of a century, despite allowing a limited number of larger steam engines back onto the system in the early 1970s. But private enterprise and the passion of railway enthusiasts wasn't to be outdone. As branches were closed and locomotives were withdrawn, the seeds of today's preservation movement were sown. When the Wallingford branch finally closed, already truncated to the malt silo sidings, a preservation group swung into action, and the line remains today. It was in 1993 that another Victorian steam locomotive reappeared at Wallingford, working trains in push-pull fashion again. This was one of the former Midland Railway Johnson half-cab 1F060 tanks, which had survived at the steelworks at Staveley in the Midlands. Its continued existence being due to a contract to supply locomotives for a hundred years. Its last days there can be seen in volume three of this series, which looks at the LMS then and now. The Wallingford preservationists had to overcome many obstacles, most notably the construction of a road bypass that severed the line. A solution was arrived at, the provision of a level crossing, which the train is seen passing over. The malt silo still exists, but is no longer rail served. The little engine was purchased for preservation and restored to working order in the early 1990s and commenced a round of visits to some of the smaller and newer preserved lines, such as the Wallingford branch. Its arrival here helped boost the embryo scheme considerably. Our final view is of a railway with a future, something not envisaged by those who saw the last train off in 1959. On second thoughts, perhaps they did know something after all. We were surprised to see so many smiling faces at what was supposed to be a wick. How many of those people have returned to travel on the reinvigorated line? The next area to which we turn our attention has had a rather different railway history in recent years. On the 30th of March 1964, a small prairie number 4593 enters Yeovil Town Station and departs for Yeovil Penn Mill. The railways of Yeovil were very complex. This is a purely western service. A southern service was operated from the town station to Yeovil Junction, by this time using one of Collett's 6400-060 pannier tanks. Collett had designed these tanks to replace the venerable 2021 class panniers. 25 of the 5400 and 40 of the 6400 class appeared which were auto-fitted. 50 further non-auto-fitted engines of the 7400 class were also built. Number 6435 and 6412 are seen pulling and pushing two auto-coach trailers at Yeovil Town Station. 
By coincidence, both engines survived the Holocaust and are preserved. Forty-five ninety-three, having brought the train back from Penmill, is seen in the engine shed yard at Town Station. Town was a joint station for the Western and Southern, and sadly, the only one of Yeovil's three stations to be closed. The Quantock Flyer Rail Tour on the 16th of February 1964 is our next scene at Yeovil Penn Mill Station. The train is double-headed by Pannier Tank 9663 and Prairie Tank 4593. As already intimated, the lines around Yeovil had a complicated history. The first line in the area was the Bristol and Exeter's broad gauge line from Durston to Yeovil Town, which came into use on the 1st of October 1853. The next line was the GWR's broad gauge line from Froome to Weymouth, reaching Yeovil Penn Mill on the 1st of September 1856, and was converted to standard gauge in 1874. Finally, the London and South Western Railway reached Yeovil Town by a branch from its West of England main line at Yeovil Junction Station on the 1st of June 1860. In the space of seven years, three railways had reached Yeovil. The line to Yeovil Town Station was taken by the rail tour, and 6435 can be seen in the platform with its auto train. Although town was built by the Western, the Southern owned the locomotive sheds here. In the engine shed, the very effective piercing electric lights of a bullet Pacific can be seen. The special was routed to Taunton by the original Bristol and Exeter line via Montacute and Durston. This line had reached Taunton on the 1st of July, 1842. The engines disappeared into Taunton's engine shed for servicing. A scene familiar to all who travelled on these end of steam rail tours followed, which would cause apoplexy today amongst health and safety officials. The passengers milled about in the shed yard as the locomotives were shunted around the depot. Note how 4593 has been bulled up for the rail tour. Another familiar happening in the 1960s, as locomotive maintenance standards slipped rapidly. There was a considerable incentive to clean the engines up as much as possible. The line to Chard was taken at Creech Junction on another Bristol and Exeter line which had been opened as broad gauge on the 11th of September 1866. It was converted to standard gauge in 1891, one year before the complete abolition of Brunel's broad gauge. The classic Brunelian stations at Hatch and Chard Central were passed before the rail tour reached Chard Junction on the Waterloo to Exeter main line. Passenger services on this line had already been withdrawn on the 10th of September 1962. The last part of the line from Chard Central to Chard Junction was built to enable transshipment between the broad and narrow gauge systems of the GWR and LSWR, respectively. Now we turn to the railways of the Yeovil district as they are today. Starting at Yeovil Penn Mill, the only one of the two GWR stations to survive. An HST is seen on a service from the West Country for Paddington diverted via the old LSWR main line via Honiton and then from Yeovil Junction to Penn Mill. This was due to flooding north of Exeter on the normal western main line. HSTs are rare visitors to Yeovil, which normally has a sprinter-based service operating between Weymouth and Bristol via Westbury.
to a chronic shortage of sprinter units, the Weymouth to Westbury service incorporated a curiosity for the railways of the mid-1990s, becoming one of only three lines still to utilise locomotive hauled passenger stock on local services. There's only one locomotive and one set of coaches, which have to be specially hired in for these duties. station itself has changed little since we saw it in the 1960s and still boasts a signal box and full semaphore signaling. Even some sidings remain in the goods yard, albeit with no traffic. However, the connection to Yeovil Town Station has long gone, the latter proving to be one of the most poignant now and then comparisons we have yet seen. This is the junction outside the station where the GWR line from Penmill came in, in the background. The southern line having been in the foreground where the cameraman is standing. As can be seen, the whole area has become a car park. The only visible link to the then views is the overbridge, which used to mark the end of the platforms and where the two lines diverged. Cars used to pull up here in front of the station buildings but now they carry on across the location of the old platforms, which is where the camera is standing, right in the middle of the car park. Once again, the road over bridge is the only visual clue as we pan round to the site of what was the southern shed, although the retaining walls have a distinctly railway feel about them. Now the only engine on shed is a fire engine. This was the locomotive yard, now fully landscaped. Although it's sad for railway enthusiasts to see such a devastating changes, it's a fact that the central location of Yeovil Town Station has meant that it has effectively had a new lease of life in a form that suits modern requirements. The same applies to the first railway to reach Yeovil, which has been converted into a road evidenced by the shape of the bridges, obviously built to cover railway tracks. This was the Bristol and Exeter line from Durston. It lasted from 1853 to 1966. Who knows how long it will remain as a road? There are plenty of railway survivors on the line from Creech to Chard, also traversed by the Quantock Flyer back in 1964. The substantial goods shed and the Brunellian station buildings are still in use at Ilminster, although not for railway purposes. Much of the old track bed can still be seen, although parts of it have, as in so many instances in this series, been severed and converted to road use. This section is between Ilminster and Chard. Chard Central station buildings also remain in use today although there is no evidence of any planning in the way it has been put to use. The well-remembered overall roof and canopy remains, now fully enclosed. The rail tour had run as far as Chard Junction on the southern main line. The branch over which it travelled is no more. The track bed is now being used to store timber, transported of course by road, despite the fact that a railway still runs nearby. In fact, although the southern main line still has passenger trains stopping at Chard Junction, this is for passing purposes on the single line section of the route and the station is actually closed. R5 
final area is South Wales, whose industries were massively expanded around the railways in the Victorian era. On our way there, we see a BR Class 9F followed by a Great Western Grange at Lydney, on the line from the Midlands to South Wales. In the heart of South Wales, Hawksworth Barrier Tank No. 9480 is seen at Radder, a major junction and marshalling yard to the north of Cardiff. Churchwood designed Royal Number 7320, an unidentified hall, and a 7200 tank pass in quick succession at Llantrisant, on the main line from Cardiff to Swansea. Llantrisant was an important junction and sums up an important part of the South Wales railway scene, as the Great Western was crossed by the Taff Vale Railway here, the latter using running powers over GW metals to access its Abathaw line. In the GWR yards, Churchwood designed 4200 280 tank, number 4277, built at Swindon in 1920, moves a heavy coal train out of the sidings. 4277 is now preserved in working order. Pannier tank 9798 on the connecting line alongside the yards races another Pannier tank on the GWR main line near the station. Coal was the main traffic in South Wales, moving the coal from the mines to the docks. 5696 and another Collet 5600 share the yard at Ogilvy Colliery on the other side of the mountain with a National Coal Board Austerity Saddle Tank. This colliery was on the Brecon and Merthyr Railways line from Merthyr to Park Oyd. The old London and North Western Railway had a line to South Wales, which ran into Swansea from the south, alongside Swansea Bay. Pannier Tank 9677 pauses briefly at a sandy-covered Swansea Bay station. Her final destination was not too far away, Hayes Scrapyard in Bridgend, during January 1965. The Great Western had a line from Llanelli to the north, connecting to the Central Wales line of the LMWR, which had running paths. At Pantafunnan, there was a subshed of Llanelli, and 7213 and Pannier Tank 3698 are seen in the shed yard. Nearby, on the Swansea district lines, which avoid Swansea itself, was Velin Vran, where 7231 brings a whole train past the impressive signal box. Pannier Tank 8739 follows as it pushes a brake van through the yard. Havrodonas was on the line between Crumlin and Pontypool Road and served a large colliery. Hawksworth Pannier Tank number 9488 heads a passenger train towards the famous Crumlin Viaduct, and a collet pannier heads away from it on 18th of April 1964. Another Hawksworth Pannier Tank 3406 is on a loaded coal train at Abercunnan on the section of the Taffdale Railway which was opened to Cardiff in 1840. 3406 was scrapped at Hayes of Bridgend in February 1965. A collet pannier proceeds up the valley towards Aberdeen. Finally, we visit Tondee Shed, the backdrop to Collet 5600 Class 062s, number 6657 and 5602. This class of 200 engines was built mainly for service in the Welsh Valleys. 6657 was built by Armstrong Whitworth of Newcastle in 1928 and scrapped at wards of Britain Ferry in October 1965. 5602 was built at Swindon in 1924 and scrapped there in January 1965, both having spent their whole working lives in South Wales. Tondi was the headquarters of the Flindy and Ogno Railway, being absorbed by the Great Western prior to the grouping in 1923. Our last then shot is of Collet number 5659, coming onto the shed at Tom D. Our views of the railway scene in South Wales now show a great deal of change and variety. We return to Radder on the occasion of the 150th anniversary celebrations for the Taff Vale Railway, 
which saw a steam engine, BR Standard Class 4 264 tank, number 80080, working up the valleys. Radar's marshalling yards remain, but are a shadow of their former selves. Also a shadow of their former selves are the yards at Lantricent, now renamed Ponteclin. The through line still exists but is disused, and all the Taffway lines here are gone. Engineers' trains are the only users of the yards now. Also gone is that charismatic LNWR line alongside Swansea Bay. Today, inevitably, a road widening scheme has absorbed much of the track bed, but part forms a footpath for pedestrians braving the fierce winds. The line closed in 1964. At Pantafunnan, the site of the old shed has gone although part of the goods yard remains, as the branch to Bryn Ammon still exists to serve a privately operated open-cast coal mine. The single-car Sprinter diesel unit is on the main line to the Central Wales line. A pair of single unit rail cars is seen from the other side of the station, heading north onto the Central Wales line. The advent of modern signalling methods means that Pantafunnan controls the whole of the route now. Two-car sprinters are the usual trains on most of the remaining South Wales branches today. This one is entering Abercunnan on a southbound working from Merthyr. The line to Aberdeer, on which we saw the two pannier tanks, is seen going off to the left. South Wales's railway map was one of the most confusing of all, but is much simplified today. Most valleys had at least two separate lines running up them, feeding the hundreds of collieries. Some even boasted three lines. Today, most valleys still have at least one line, but due to the decimation of the coal industry in South Wales, many are served only by passenger trains such as this, with no freight at all. Nelson and Llan Cayach is typical of South Wales lines today. Reduced to a single line, it sees colliery freight traffic only, although two major collieries on this line have recently closed. The Brecon and Myrtle line has long since disappeared. The site of Ogilvy Colliery is now a park for today's more favoured methods of transporting our mineral wealth, or what's left of it. Havradunas Colliery and the whole of the celebrated Cross Valleys route from Pontypool Road and the Crumlin Viaduct have all disappeared from the railway map. 
At one time, it was hoped to preserve the latter structure, but to no avail. Our last scenes are, as for the then scenes, at Tondi. The sheds where we saw the Collet 5600 tanks were situated in the background of this view. It is now wasteland. However, Tondi is still the junction for a number of freight lines, and one of the few bright spots in a rather gloomy tale, the reinstated passenger service from Bridge End to My Steg. Inaugurated in 1992, we can now end our programme on a happier note. If you've enjoyed this program, look out for the other four in this series, as well as other programs from Ian Allen SBS Video. The History of Britain's Railways, Decades of Steam, and the celebrated Railway Roundabout programs.